Well, good evening. Good evening to tonight's program, Out of Bondage, Ending Forced Child Labor in Nepal and India. I'm Jonathan Eder, Programs Manager at the Mary Baker Eddy Library, and I'll be the moderator for tonight's panel discussion. And I'm delighted to be joined by Amelia Newcomb, who's International News Editor for the Christian Science Monitor. And we're just going to give a little bit of an introduction before we invite our panelists on stage. So, um, hello, Amelia. Hello. Nice <laughs> and, to be here. And um, it's wonderful for us to be gathering in this building um, of the Christian Science Publishing Society. In many ways, it is a, um, it is a backdrop itself to the uh, kind of journalism that we'll be exploring today in this story. And it also explains how the Mary Baker Eddy Library and the Christian Science Monitor have come together to create and produce this kind of public programming. We both inhabit this building. Uh, the Monitor has been here a lot longer than we have. Um, and, and in fact, it uh, predates this building. The Monitor goes back to 1908 when it was founded by Mary Baker Eddy. We, on the other hand, at the Mary Baker Eddy Library, trace our origins to 2002. So we're from entirely different centuries. Um, but our mandate at the library is really to care for archival collections that speak to the entire history um, of the Christian Science Plaza here and of uh, Mary Baker Eddy's life and career and the institutions that she founded, including that of the Monitor. So in many ways, we are constantly behind the scenes uh, working with content that pertains to the Monitor um, and pertains to Mary Baker Eddy's vision for it. So it's very nice for us to be able to make that behind the scenes work public in a program of this, of this kind. So we're grateful uh, to you, the Christian Science Monitor, to uh, bring us out of the shadows and into the light. Um, for Mary Baker Eddy, uh, the Christian Science Monitor in many ways represented the culmination of an extraordinary career. And we're so grateful to have the Monitor as a touchstone for us here at the library to introduce Mary Baker Eddy to the various audiences that come in uh, to explore what we have to offer here. Um, Mary Baker Eddy throughout her life wrote. Um, even at the beginning of her life, she wrote for newspapers and magazines. So she was very well acquainted with the media. Um, her life is distinguished by introducing some very radical and new ideas into public thought. So she recognized very much the importance of being able to write across differences and to clarify complex and profound issues in order to benefit the reader. And that is very much at the heart of what the Monitor uh, strives to do in its journalism. Mary Baker Eddy also eventually became the news herself. Um, at a certain point in her career, she became a very leading public figure. She had the attention of the media of, of the time on her almost relentlessly. So she understood what that meant to get beyond that kind of celebrity journalism and into something deeper. And so when she created the Monitor, she gave it the mission to injure no man, but to bless all mankind. And the Monitor since then has been endeavoring to live up to that extraordinary standard. And, um, and so we're just very pleased to see how that's manifesting today with stories and with subject matter like that, which we are going to explore this evening. So Amelia, I'd just love to hear about how that sort of backstory of the Monitor and its history and its foundations relates to what's going on with the Monitor today and how that's exemplified in this particular story and this particular content that we'll be looking at this evening. All right, well, it's a pleasure to be here and I want to welcome you all. I'm really grateful to you all for joining us this evening. Um, this story, I think, when Michael Holtz, uh, our monitor correspondent first approached me about this story, it seemed like such a logical one for the monitor to do because it really illuminates monitor values. It's, uh, Michael uh, was part of a reporting team that earlier this year did an extensive series on human trafficking uh, that appeared in the monitor. And as he did that research, 
uh, this story came forward. Uh, he learned about this story uh, in Nepal. And uh, what, came, what came to the surface was, as you, as you all know, Nepal had a pretty devastating earthquake about a year and a half ago. And uh, obviously, in the aftermath of the earthquake, there was an urgent need to rebuild. And as part of that rebuilding, that put a lot of demand on um, the Brick Hill, at the center, of, on the Brick Hill industry, which is key to rebuilding. They make a lot of the bricks that are necessary to rebuild the structures that came down in the quake. And uh, that, the urgency of that need for rebuilding, combined with an influx of humanitarian aid, raised a lot of concern that uh, there might be a spike in human trafficking and in forced labor. And the key victims of that forced labor might be children. So that's how this story started out. And that alone is worth reporting on. But what else we want to do with the monitor is uh, there was another impetus, which is, um, gets to the monitor's lens on the news. You do a disservice to readers if you report only on the problem of the story. We need to, as Jonathan noted, expose problems around the globe. That's what we want to do. But we also want to report on the solutions and on the people who are thinking about solutions to seemingly intractable problems and are implementing them. One of them is joining us from Nepal via Skype a little later in the program, Homraj Acharya, who is trying to change labor practices in these brick kilns where the um, working conditions are pretty dire and where children make up a good part of the workforce. Um, so that's, uh, that um, is a key element of what the monitor is trying to do. It's showing paths to progress. It's looking too often, as I said, we look at the problem, but not at the solution. And people are inherently problem solvers. They are trying to work out solutions at universities elsewhere. And too often their voices aren't heard in the media. So um, we undertook this project and um, we were really excited about it because it also is was an opportunity, it represented an opportunity to uh, report on a story that really has been neglected. Uh, the Nepal earthquake made headlines when it happened and stayed in the news for a little while, but it hasn't gotten much press since. And yet, these issues of child labor, of people without housing and so forth, are still really very urgent. And so that underscores another value of the monitor, which is illuminating stories that do fall out of the headlines or not on the front pages uh, amid the maelstrom of daily news and yet are really important to understanding our fellow man, to understanding humanity and to inspiring possibly help people to connect better with the world around them and maybe be motivated to take action in ways they hadn't thought of because they are seeing people who step by step are figuring out how to break down problems that can seem very uh, uh, resilient or re very um, uh, unable to be changed, you know, very uh, intractable. So um, as part of that, we were very excited and happy to partner with the Undertold Stories Project in conjunction with the PBS NewsHour, their title, their name of their project, explains very clearly where they're coming from and how it uh, jives very nicely with monitor values. And we were really grateful for support from the Pulitzer C Center for Crisis Reporting, whose um, efforts are also aimed at bringing to light stories that too often don't make it into the mainstream news. So that's what we hope you'll get out of this presentation tonight. And again, thank you all for joining us. And back to you. Thank you, you Amelia. So we'll let you exit, and then we'll invite our panelists on. So as, as they're arriving, I will give them a, a little bit of an introduction. 
Seated next, right, right next to me is Elizabeth Donger, and she's research associate at the Harvard FXB Center for Health and Human Rights. And uh, she's done a lot of work on this issue of labor trafficking in, in India. And um, she, uh, she, with uh, Dr. Jacqueline Vaba, wrote a, um, an important um, report, Is This Protection? Analyzing India's Approach to the Rescue and Reintegration of Children Trafficked for Labor. So welcome, Elizabeth. And then next to Elizabeth is Michael Holtz, whom uh, Amelia alluded to in her remarks, and he was uh, lead writer for these uh, monitor reporting projects in Nepal and India. So I don't know how many of you have, have already read his, his work, but um, you can still find it on the monitor uh, website. Um, after Nepal's earthquake, a push to rebuild without child labor, and trafficked workers in India band together in hope of disrupting ugly cycles. So welcome, Michael. And next to Michael is his companion on these reporting projects, Anne Hermes, staff photographer for uh, the Christian Science Monitor. And a little bit later, we'll uh, see some examples of her uh, photography from these expeditions to uh, Nepal and India. But you've also those of you who came in early uh, enjoyed her uh, video that she put together to give you a sense of what goes on in the brick kilns of Nepal. So that was a, a wonderful uh, picture of, of what's, what goes on. So thanks so much for that. And then next to Anne is Fred DeSam Lazaro, who is director of the Undertold Stories Project that uh, Amelia also alluded to, um, correspondent for PBS NewsHour. And uh, he worked alongside Anne and, and Michael in producing a video about the brick kilns in, uh, in Nepal. So Fred, I thought um, we'd show that and let you just uh, take us into it with a little bit of background on how this is an undertold story and how um, this video helps to make that story um, a little less undertold and better understood. Thanks, Jonathan. I was actually going to read the the uh, questions that you sent me, but you articulated it uh, perfectly for me to, to set up this video, which is usually done on television by either uh, Judy Woodruff or Gwen Eiffel, so it's unnerving to introduce your own <laughs> video. Um, but you asked some, an interesting question, and that is, in, in what ways are the issues of forced child labor not adequately um, or accurately told, and I think it's implicit in everything that Amelia said until now, that <clears throat> this is not a story that's, that's adequately told. I also think that in general, uh, especially on the broadcast side of the media business, that um, there is a, an anti-small country bias. Um, the, the smaller a country is in, in terms of its geopolitical footprint, the less attention it tends to get absent a major natural disaster, like an earthquake, for example. And so um, I'm really grateful to have real estate on the news hour to be able to tell these kinds of stories. Um, I should add that I'm a long time, not as regular as I'd like to be, but a long time reader of the Christian Science Monitor and very much subscribe to that philosophy of telling underreported um, stories. So these are the stories that we tend to gravitate toward. That's why we, we, we basically came to it. The biggest challenge we have is in really dogging stories so they continue to get attention. It is very um, difficult to get shelf space, uh, to use a different analogy. Unlike the New York Times, which says all the news that's fit to print, for us, it's all the news that fits. We just don't have uh, enough room to tell these stories adequately to say nothing at the expense of getting them, them covered. There's also a cultural issue related to stories from some parts of the world. The more distant they are, the more foreign they are perceived and therefore less relevant. And that's the reason for the existence of the Undertold Stories project, which I had, which is to make the foreign less foreign for our audience. And that is an attempt to get beyond 
um, even beyond empathy, if not to actually generate empathy at one level, but to get beyond it so that these stories and these people are seen as relevant to our lives in our audience um, in the United States. And we do this tactically by looking for strong characters, strong human stories to tell. And when uh, it comes my turn later on, and, and then I look forward to, to adding more um, on this subject of how we tell these stories. But I think that's about as much as, as this introduction needs well, I, to I about. also um, want to <coughs> introduce our other panelist, the strong character that, um, or one of the strong characters that Fred is alluding to, and that is Homraj, who's on Homraj Acharya, who is um, being fed in from Kathmandu in Nepal. Hello, Homraj. Hello, good morning. Um, I'm sorry that I, I didn't introduce you initially. I think I'm guilty of uh, some of that problem of forgetting about these <laughs> areas that are quite not right at my um, footsteps. So apologies to you, Homraj, but um, I know of your bigness of your heart and your, your empathy for humanity, so I'm sure you'll forgive me. Um, Homraj is uh, country director for the uh, Global Alliance and the um, Brick, Better Brick Nepal um, project. So uh, we'll be hearing more from uh, Homraj, but we'll also be learning more about Homraj from this video as well as um, two of other uh, panelists. So, um, shall we start it? Video. <laughs> Heavy lifting is a way of life in this Himalayan country, but workers in Nepal's brick kilns are in a league of their own. Here, work is an endless cycle of loads that weigh more than the laborers who carry them, of polluted, oppressive conditions, grinding coal to stoke kilns that must be kept alive at some 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit round the clock of molding clay into raw bricks that feed the ovens. You don't use your brains to do this work. It's just physical labor. But we have no choice. We have debts to pay. Tilok Moktan and his wife Rina say life is a never-ending cycle of debt. For medical bills, for just running the household, they say, and to put their children in school. I want to see that my children are educated, that they complete their higher education. Work is too tough in the brick sector. They'll be up at midnight before it gets too hot, yeah. work until dawn, sleep for a few hours, get up, start molding more bricks and do it again the next night. It's physically demanding for, at, all, at all aspects. And I think that's why it's startling to see children. We partnered with Christian Science Monitor reporter Michael Holtz and photographer Ann Hermes, who took these still photographs on a story we found especially relevant now in this earthquake-ravaged country about an industry notorious for trapping children and families in poverty. I think we really wanted to get a sense of now that reconstruction is finally getting underway in Nepal and demands for bricks is going to go so high, um, what, how that would affect the brick industry itself in terms of that there be increases in child labor, increases in bonded labor. There are some 1,100 brick kilns across Nepal, a number that's grown recently, anticipating large-scale rebuilding from the earthquake. So these are the areas where uh, they make bricks. All told, they employ about 250,000 people, says Homraj Acharya, who is part of a two-year-old initiative called Better Brick Nepal, or BBN. And how many children, again, would you say are, are working in kilns today? In uh, we, can, we can find around uh, 60,000. 60,000. Children, yeah. Because, you know, it's a family-based uh, uh, industry. They live in brick shacks surrounded by Lego-like fortresses. Molded bricks stacked up at the start of an almost pre-industrial process. For brick makers, there are no set working hours. The basic rule is you work until you're too tired to continue. And there's every incentive to continue to the point of exhaustion because workers are paid by the brick. They get a little less than one U.S. cent for every one of these that they produce. Because it's paid on a piece basis. So if children are making like 100 bricks more, so that means you might get 100 uh, So they help the worth. productivity, which helps their wages. Yeah, exactly. Do the children help mold bricks, I asked the Moktans. 
Seven-year-old Ritesh, no, but 12-year-old Rithika, yes. She works a few hours a week. She helps with the cooking, and sometimes, when their mother needs to do the cooking, she helps out with the bricks. It may seem normal for children to pitch in with chores, but Acharya says these desperately poor families invariably grow to depend excessively on the children to scrape together more income. The system creates that you know, uh, enabling environment for uh, children to be used. The Better Brick program wants to create a different environment using incentives for kiln owners. Those who sign on agree to pay for preschool facilities like this one to get children into a classroom and away from the brick workplace of their parents. And BBN works with owners and parents to ensure that older children attend school. For owners, these steps could be good business. Giving them incentive in terms of access to loans, and that is, you know, helping them to improve their quality of bricks. And then when there, there is a bidding process, we are talking to the government. So you'd want the government to procure bricks when it buys bricks from operators who are certified as not employing children and improving Absolutely, conditions. Absolutely, yeah. That's, that's one of the, uh, the, the major um, point of this uh, program. This is one of 23 kilns that have so far signed on to the program. Co-owner Shiva Regmi says he's happy to improve conditions for workers and he can certainly use the technical help. For every one brick that we make, two are broken. Regmi is a newcomer to this business. This kiln is just a few months old. And he may be more receptive to the Better Brick program than others. At another facility, the owner complained to Acharya that his industry is being unfairly singled out by advocates. We are giving opportunities to 400,000 people who work in our industry, and we don't ask their children to work. People are spreading rumors that we are hiring children, but that's not true. Many owners can technically make that claim, Acharya says, because their contracts are with adults. It's parents who press their children into service. Then there's the murkier world of subcontractors who provide laborers, many of them children who are not with their families, brought here under various arrangements by labor agents or traffickers. It was quite common to see young boys loading and herding the steady train of work animals that carry raw bricks to the kilns. It was more difficult to talk to them. In a strange twist, children here, like many other places, are told not to talk to strangers. I did manage one fleeting conversation with this young man. I had to leave school because my mom and dad weren't earning, he said, so I went to work. How did you get this job, I asked. A rich man from our village brought me here, he said. How many others accompanied him? Oh, there are many, he said. All these guys are from my village. Do you get any time to play, I asked. I do not play, he said. And no more time for a stranger. His is just one anonymous story of thousands in an underground labyrinth that preys on poverty and illiteracy, one Nepal's government admits it has few resources to police. But Home Rajacharya sees a tiny silver lining. Reconstruction will soon get into high gear with a windfall of foreign aid, and here he sees leverage. Four billion dollars has been already placed by different countries. And we want to make sure that all of those countries who are giving money to Nepalese government, to, uh, you know, we want them to use the bricks that are produced uh, child labor free. He says Nepal's Builders Association has agreed to buy bricks from kilns his program has certified as free of child labor, where they're available. And it seems more likely the Moktan family's bricks will be free of child labor, especially after our interview when I asked sixth grader Rithika what her favorite subject was. English. When you grow up, what kind of work would you like to do? I would like to be a, make a doctor. A doctor? Why? Because I want to help the poor people. Two short, hesitant sentences but to her parents, she'd moved a mountain, and she moved them to tears. I'm really proud that she was able to speak to you in English. They're tears of happiness. 
We will work as hard as we possibly can to see that she completes her education. For the PBS NewsHour, this is Fred DeSam Lazaro in Nepal's Kathmandu Valley. So Elizabeth, in, in your work um, on this same issue in India, after seeing that video, what strikes you as points in common um, between the situation in Nepal and what you've explored in India? What are the differences? And are there Homaraj Acharyas uh, doing that same sort of crusade in, in the areas of India that you've explored, and the equivalent of Better Brick Nepal? Absolutely. Um, I think that this video does an excellent job of creating this very nuanced picture of a problem that is very difficult to uh, define, to, to measure, and to confront. Uh, so I think that what I would like to do is to briefly kind of look at some of the legal definitions of child labor in order to kind of lay out um, the framework for this and then to talk about uh, some of the context in Nepal's neighbor to the South India. So really, I think that there's this baffling array of terminology that exists on this issue, this kind of bonded labor, forced labor, trafficking for forced labor. And what all these really essentially are doing is talking about work that is exploitative for children. And while we can all agree that this is a bad thing, the definition of exploitation is actually highly contested. Uh, and the international, international law says that uh, children from very poor and marginalized communities in cases need to earn. And so there are restricted availability for children above the age of 12 to work in situations where it is not interfering with their education and not hazardous. But the thing is that understanding what hazardous means is not always clear. And from a protection standpoint, it's very important. So, for example, at the moment, the Indian government is trying to expand the range of practices that are considered permissible for children. They enacted an amendment to the child labor law that allows children under 14 to work in select family enterprises um, and reduce the number of banned hazardous occupations from 83 down to three. So this takes away protections for millions of Indian children who are working with family members in industries ranging from carpet making to zari making to beady rolling, cigarette rolling. Um, and so this is something that is extremely important to kind of take into account. Um, but these ambiguities clearly don't exist in the context of brick kiln working, which is highly exploitative, as we saw in this video. And India's brick kiln sector is vast. There are 125,000 estimated brick kilns operating across the country. And children that work in these environments often come from very poor and marginalized communities. They're often internal migrants from poorer areas, and they're subject to a range of abuses in terms of uh, health risks, long-term health risks and physical and sexual abuse, and many, very few of them are in school, um, particularly because it's difficult to provide long-term care to children that keep on moving. Uh, so it, now turning really to the scale of in, this problem in India more generally, for reasons that I outlined earlier in terms of the methodology, but also uh, because of the inherent difficulty in measuring this problem, statistics really aren't available, but the numbers we do have are really shocking. Uh, so in 2011, it was estimated that 4.3 million children in India are in child labor, and that in one year, 2011, 2012, 125,000 have been trafficked. Uh, so really, the, the problem is absolutely vast and requires a very complex um, resulting response and turning to responses these can be really be categorized in in three different buckets uh, so we look at criminalization on the one hand then protection of victims and also prevention which is really where a lot of uh, better brick nepal's work fits in uh, in criminalization first is incredibly important because 
forced and bonded child labor is an incredibly lucrative and low risk um, activity for employers. And also convictions can give a lot of funding and support to children and their families. But particularly in India, uh, conviction rates are incredibly low. Uh, it's estimated that throughout 2008, 2012, of the 450,000 cases that were reported of child trafficking, that only 5% were prosecuted and 0.75 resulted in convictions. And this is because the just judicial system is incredibly backlogged and all of these challenges also apply in the Nepalese context. Um, but turning then to protection, so the government of India has this incredibly well elaborated legal and policy framework, better elaborated actually than Nepal's to govern removing children from exploitative situations and reintegrating them. And so in theory, this involves uh, taking children away with a rescue team and providing them with a long-term care plan for support, which involves safe accommodation, economic support, uh, education, and also healthcare needs. So it's a really diverse array of things that are required that are across large distances, that require coordination of very different departments and require sustained investment really by the government and the civil society sector. And research shows that in reality, these rescue and reintegration really amounts to removing children from situations of exploitation, um, publishing about the number of children that have been saved and returning children to the environments from which they came from without much subsequent support. And this leaves them very s exposed to all of the same risks and vulnerabilities that meant that they were exploited in the first place. And so this is the predictable right result that many of them simply return to work. And the third category is prevention. And this is the one that doesn't, the government of India is really focused on criminalization and on protection. And prevention, and which is a lot of what we've seen here is really something that is underutilized, underfunded, and under-researched. And so this is really looking at the root causes of child forced labor and bonded labor, um, looking at the socioeconomic and cultural forces that make children vulnerable to abuse. And this goes beyond government initiatives that look at anti-poverty. It encompasses looking at the demand for child labor, like Better Britain and Paul, by looking at incentivizing employers to have more ethical standards. But also, it involves investing in the factors that drive supply. So investing in targeted community-based initiatives to build resilience and take advantage of local capacity. Um, and this is essential for any long-term strategy to address this really complex problem because it involves building capacity from the bottom up. So, for example, it can involve organizing workers to enforce labor laws or creating community vigilance committees or, uh, or organizing parents to get children to go back in school. And I think that this is one particular area where there's a lot of scope for investment and improvement. So really there, there are lots of similarities, but uh, this very complex problem requires complex and careful solutions and probably ones that combine these three categories of criminalization, protection, and prevention. That's great, thank you, Elizabeth. So Homraj, um, in listening to what Elizabeth had to say, I'm curious about how the, the, the relationship, the complication of um, the global and the local come together in your work with Breder Brick Nepal, um, its association uh, with um, support from outside of Nepal, but also on the ground in Nepal, and how you bring those worlds together in your activism on this issue in Nepal, and, and also just what we need to understand better about the history of Nepal, to understand the, the practice, um, how it's embedded, and, um, and, and what really needs to be done to, to lift it. Sure. Um, yeah, I think, you know, um, you know uh, connecting global and uh, local, I think issues may be local, but this is connected world. So 
I would say that globally, people in other countries have huge uh, impact through uh, bilateral and multilateral aid. Their government, you know, buying choices those entities make, you know. Uh, locally, we in Nepal uh, basically are connected to the global world economically, intellectually, in terms of, you know, shared human ethical standards. So at its core, what we are doing in brick kiln is about fair trade, really. Um, you know, that's the heart of it. And, you know, you are voting with your money uh, for against, uh, for or against, you know, certain uh, practices. So to most fair trade so far, you know, has been uh, about exports, um, you know, ethically produced things like, you know, carpet, uh, crafts, and, you know, other materials, and usually to send to uh, developed countries. Bricks are domestic products. So they are not for other people. So they are for us, Nepali. So we need to reach out to each, uh, each other and then bring fair trade inside into our own, you know, culture and then practices in our businesses. So I think that's, uh, that's going to be something that requires a lot of people to come together. And then, uh, you know, uh, sharing global best practices, uh, things that are happening, uh, you know, around the world, how, um, you know, global can impact uh, locally and then local can impact uh, globally. But uh, global actors can be a huge part of that by putting their money uh, where their morals are. You know, a lot of big construction in Nepal is done with funds from multilateral and bilateral agencies like, you know, USAID, World Bank, large INGOs, and so on. And, you know, this is particularly true after the earthquake. But it's always been, uh, you know, true. So what needs to be done is that when, you know, these organizations and these uh, multilateral, uh, you know, world bodies, uh, to, you know, try to invest their money, uh, they need to be very, um, you know, careful about that, you know, you know how those funds are being um, spent. Um, and ultimately, even when you are building schools in little villages, certainly the international money is used. You know, you might be building hospitals, you might be building libraries, you might be building, you know, classrooms for children. And then if ultimately they are coming out of, you know, on, you know, these uh, buildings are built on the backs of children and bonded labor, I mean, that should not be acceptable to, you know, uh, the local people or international people. I mean, we are talking about tourism also. You know, when people visit uh, different countries, they should be in the habit of demanding, you know, is the hotel that I'm staying at, you know, out of, um, you know, uh, this, this kind of practices? Um, is the room that I'm staying in is built, uh, you know, uh, of the bricks or, you know, construction materials that is free of child bonded and other, you know, social exploitations? Uh, that might have taken place. So I think, you know, a lot of times it comes down to if we at individual level are practicing, uh, you know, what we would like to see uh, in the in the external world. So, you know, there are so many things uh, that uh, can be done uh, from uh, individual levels. And then, uh, you know, in development, we tend to compartmentalize things, you know, so people involved in rebuilding are just thinking about structures uh, and, you know, thinking, um, like, okay, if this building is safe, you know, I think that's important, but at the same time, we have to look at, you know, what practices do we encourage or discourage uh, with our purchasing choices. So those are some of the things that uh, we really have to have, you know, a, a larger level of discussion. And it's not about just ticking boxes. You know, a lot of times uh, when people do programs and development, it's just, you know, satisfying the requirement, you know, ticking boxes, just saying, you know, you, just, you know, people might say, is there a child element? Is there a gender element in the project? Then, you know, check the box and then you are done. But, you know, what we need to do is do our, um, you know, due diligence. So you just don't pass the buck, you know, to uh, contractors or, you know, people who are doing uh, uh, th things, um, you know, at the level saying that, well, we cannot really monitor at that level. So. A lot of times it's just putting things um, in, in real perspective and taking actions. So, you know, I would say that, you know, like, for example, in Nepal, uh, Nepali people also need to, you know, talk about, you know, when we are, you know, building our shopping centers, you know, monasteries, homes, we can't build them, you know, uh, with the uh, 
the, the children's you know, exploitation and so forth. So we need to encourage responsible entrepreneurship and be responsible buyers ourselves. And that's hard and then, you know, hard for everyone, it's genuinely, but, uh, you know, but it's not as hard as being, you know, um, a kid carrying bricks, you know, um, you know, things like that. So there are a lot of things that can be done in terms of, you know, connecting uh, local versus uh, global. And then uh, you were asking about um, the, what we need to know um, about Nepal. You know, I would say that, you know, one thing is to know is, you know, we are not exotic. I mean, we are not other people. I mean, you know, uh, uh, you know we are uh, connected and then, you know, um, so child and bonded labor has been, you know, uh, practiced you know, all over the, the world uh, for, you know, various uh, times. And it was practiced in the U.S. as well. Uh, but, um, you know, things have changed. We have moved beyond that. And then certainly a lot of changes have taken place in Nepal too. So, um, you know, basically people, um, you know, need to, people, uh, sometimes, you know, what happens is that people give cultural reasons uh, for, justifying certain level kind of injustices and you know that should not be acceptable you know sometimes you know what we hear is oh you know it's village culture you know it's the that you know this that these are the type of people who really uh you know like to do this kind of things you know so they come up with all kinds of justification for injustices and it serves the purpose it serves the system so and then we have to really look into that you know dig deeper into that and um that that really helps. I mean, you know, talking about those things that people, you know, putting the blames on, uh, you know, uh, victims uh, to justify uh, whatever is, uh, you know, uh, taking place. And, you know, one thing uh, about Nepal is people have changed a lot. Uh, uh, and even in communities where sending girls to school was considered, uh, you know, uh, useless and economic rationalization was given. And then now those same people are actually sending, um, you know, um, uh, their uh, daughters to schools. And even at the expense, um, uh, you know, traditionally that, you know, you, you would be uh, considered, well, you know, you are not doing uh, the right thing because, you know, girls should not be sent to school. In those communities, uh, people are actually, um, you know, sending their daughters um, to school and looking for that, uh, especially in the, you know, Muslim and Tharu communities. And now, uh, when you go to villages, uh, even girls are going to uh, uh, school. So things have actually changed and we have to build on those changes and then see how lives have changed through uh, that kind of, you know, uh, uh, questioning and taking the steps forward. And, but, you know, having respect for people also means not accepting rationalization excuses. And sometimes, you know, uh, in the, you know, uh, development um, world, some, you know, um, in, in, in the area, people sometimes, uh, you know, look at saying that, well, you know, people uh, who you child labor naturally want to think um, that they need money or something, you know, those kind of things. And rationalization is always given. And like, for example, uh, when we talk to the kiln owners, they say, you know, they are doing service to these uh, people. When we go to restaurants where we have seen uh, people employing children, they are saying that, well, you know, these uh, people need a job, they came here, and then, you know, everybody wants to uh, rationalize uh, because, you know, they don't want to portray themselves as bad guys. And, but we have to really look at whether, you know, these uh, people uh, who are using these children uh, are actually um, doing the right thing. Um, and if they are so charitable, why can't they support them um, uh, in their schools and so uh, so forth. So I would say, you know, we have to develop this, um, you know, culture of asking questions, uh, you know, holding people accountable, even at personal level. I mean, you know, when you are going to a hotel and restaurant, just ask them, you know, I mean, that's what I do. You know, my first question is when I go to a restaurant in Nepal, I ask, do you have children working? Can I check and, you know, check your kitchens? And, you know, and that's when you know their faces, you know, um, uh, changes and then you know and next time you go and then or at least that gives them some idea maybe I'm not doing something right so people have to take you know personal responsibility I think that's what we have to uh, really encourage 
uh, uh, people to do. So ultimately change uh, comes through personal uh, initiatives and then taking actions. And then if everybody did, um, did that at their own level, I think uh, we'll have a much better uh, uh, place. So, you know, those were uh, some of the things in terms of, you know, understanding, uh, you know, uh, cultural uh, issues and then looking at, um, you know, basically getting away from exoticizing and then seeing, you know, people are different and, you know, culturally some people might be more, uh, you know, interested in exploiting other people. I think that, that narrative definitely has to change. And that does exist uh, in a lot of places, even even within our own country, you know, people uh, from different communities will say, you know, oh, people from that, you know, uh, village and area, you know, they like to employ their children, you know, well, they, you know, need money because they don't have other sources of income. But that economic justification also doesn't really uh, work uh, because, you know, we have seen that. Um, and if you really change people's uh, thinking, they will definitely change and then that economic argument doesn't really uh, hold uh, uh, much water. I mean, of course, you know, there are a lot of poor people, but there are different ways of addressing poverty rather than by, you know, using children and then exploiting, uh, you know, uh, vulnerable people. So, you know, those things are, um, you know, uh, need to be looked at. And then you had another uh, question, um, you know, uh, you know, thought about like how we might bring uh, together, how we might uh, be able to work together. So, you know, first thing is that we have to act on our uh, commitments. And as government, we have to enforce the laws. And as customers, we have to put our money where, uh, you know, we think it's the right thing to do. NGO and international government can show, you know, seriously by following through. And then as the business community, you know, we can uh, basically show by, you know, you can do good business and at the same time you can actually make money. You don't have to be really bad to, uh, uh, you know, do good business. So, you know, those are some of the things that, you know, we have to really uh, talk about. And then also make whatever practices, whatever the right thing that is, uh, part of our daily lives, you know, and then not turn away from, you know, the problems that we might see. Uh, you know, a lot of times when people see the problem, they say, well, you know, there might be something, um, you know, the, you know, coming coming up with reasons to sort of, you know, not be part of that uh, solution and, you know, running away. I think that's, that's very common and it's understandable, you know, we cannot solve everybody's problem everywhere uh, in the world. But if we can raise questions, if we can actually, you know, uh, bring up the issue, sometimes make uh, something we might be see through our naked eyes, but those might be invisible issues. Like, you know, you can see the big chimneys, but under those big chimneys uh, and then, you know, the smoky cloud, you cannot see what's happening. So uh, those, those things are very, very invisible, you know, what happens. And then one of the things through this program and then uh, through PBS's uh, uh, story, you know, those invisible stories have been now uh, made um, visible nationally, internationally, and, uh, you know, a lot of things right after that, the Nepal government, you know, through a lot of efforts have actually the Ministry of Ed um, Labor issued uh, a letter to all the departments in the country saying that, you know, if you are, you know, reconstructing building, um, you know, make sure that your uh, construction materials are socially responsible. So that's, you know, um, you know, good, uh, achievement and then you know we should uh, promote things like that so through bvn program and then the stories like uh, christian monitor science monitor and then uh, pbs and then our you know local uh, journalist you know uh, basically writing about this uh, you know bringing people's attention to this particular problem the government is actually becoming uh, more responsive to it and then you know we are engaging the, uh, the international community, local community saying that, okay, guys, this is the right time. If we cannot fix around this time, you know, it will be very, very long time for us to, uh, you know, address this issue. So I think, um, you know, things are, um, you know, uh, moving in terms of raising the awareness, but I think we have to see the real changes taking place and it's going to take some time, uh, you know, uh, for us. So bringing a lot of people's energy, creating a synergy among ourselves, uh, discussing things, uh, putting people on the spot, uh, you know, pointing it out, all of those things 
uh, need to be done. And then, you know, uh, you know, as I said earlier that, you know, we start to, um, you know, um, change the, you know, we need to change the narrative that, you know, it's uh, that maybe the laws alone uh, might not be able to fix the problems. Like uh, the narrative that, you know, uh, these people are villains and then these people are heroes. I think that narrative also uh, need to change because, you know, villainizing people probably, um, you know, it's not going to uh, help. So uh, what we do through BBN program is basically, you know, looking at where people's uh, strengths are and then where weaknesses are and then where uh, the tipping points are for uh, making changes. So like, for example, in the brick industry, providing them with... Uh, uh, incentives, uh, you know, making sure that they understand the uh, laws and then these laws are, if they are actually implemented, they would be in big trouble. So before that happens, the, why don't you guys, you know, uh, uh, um, change your practices and then we'll help you to get there. You know, it's not like, you know, you guys are bad people, you know, we are going to come after you. You know, it's like, okay, now, um, you know, these are some of the things that you can do, and then this is how it can be changed. So those are the things, you know, that are actually uh, uh, helping a lot. I mean, you know, we, are work, uh, we have influx of uh, brick kiln owners wanting to be part of the program. You know, just recently, you know, the 60 brick kilns have uh, um, written to us, you know, applying to be part of the program. But we cannot do that because, you know, I mean, there are resource constraints and all those kind of things. So... Yes, we can come together and we can definitely bring changes. Um, and, you know, and we have to keep talking about these issues so people understand. Well, thank you so much, Omaraj. So I, um, I think um, we got sort of a sense of what activism is um, from, from Homeraj, the spirit of activism. And so, Michael, I'd, I'd love to sort of visit with you what it was like to encounter people like Homeraj on the ground and you, you Anne. Um, and then your work in, in India and how you see that sort of spirit of activism and a lot of the points that he brings up about um, it being about a sort of sea change in, in consciousness and attitude um, rather than associating it as a, a question of good versus evil or victims versus villains. So um, if you could just sort of bring us on the ground to your experience. Yeah, um, sure. Um, well, I, I think the work that Homeraj is doing <clears throat> is really great because, you know, in natural disasters, time and time again, after the Indonesian tsunami that happened in 2004, after the earthquake in Haiti a few years after that, I mean, it's known that things like uh, child labor, forced labor increase after these events. And so for Homeraj to really take the moment after the earthquake happened and realize that, yes, there's a chance that th these things could increase, but now is the time to really make a difference because there is so much money coming in. We can talk to these international donors, these organizations, try to get some sort of strings attached saying that, well, give us your money, but we want to make sure that that money is not going towards kilns that employ child labor, things like that. So just taking this moment that normally can result in so many awful things and really trying to make the most of it, I think, is what... Um, most impressed me about the work that, that he was doing there in Nepal and in India too, some of the work you see on the ground. Um, you know, these people are in these kilns and the conditions are so awful there. And then even when they get out of the kilns, I mean, there's no guarantee, as was talked earlier, that they won't get back in the same situation again. And so having organi <clears throat> organizations there who can really stick with them through the process of getting them out of the kiln, making sure they get access to the government programs that do exist, they just don't know about. I mean, there's funding for education, for job training, they can get uh, employment. I mean, there's all sorts of things that are in place that if they just know about and have access to, it can really help them avoid falling back into the same situation that you see time and time again. I mean, it's, it's, it's multiple generations, you know, kids and their parents and their grandparents who are in these situations. And so to have someone who can really help them avoid falling back into that, I think is, is key to the work that Homeraj is doing, to the work that a lot of the organizations in India are doing um, that I think will really make uh, a lot of difference. That's great. So um, we'll project some of uh, the images that you took, um, and if you could just give us a sense of what you look for as a, as a um, investigative photographer when you're on exploring these stories. Um, what do you want to find in those images to complement and amplify what um, the work that Michael is doing? 
Well, it helps working with a great reporter who's <laughs> communicative, and we had a lot of back and forth, so I knew what he was going for. We were on the ground at the same time. I got a lot of information from Homraj about his efforts, and a lot of it, I, I mean, I, a lot of it, I didn't have to be that great of a photographer. The situations themselves were just so dramatic, cinematic. I know your videographer felt the same way, um, but you, you try to target your efforts. And so there were a few families that we followed specifically, and I tried to spend as much time as possible with them. And oftentimes that just means sitting in their one-room homes made out of the bricks that they mold themselves with tin roofs in the terrible heat for a couple of hours until the right moment comes along and you try to find a quiet moment that also displays what their personal lives are like outside of the work. So that's really what I tried to hone in on. Um, and I got to follow some of the families that were highlighted in the PBS piece as well. And you just, you spend a lot of time on the ground with them, getting them comfortable with you. You spend a lot of time not taking photos. And then you spend a lot of time, you know, getting dirty in the middle of the kiln, you know, right next to the workers and, and that kind of a thing. So it was a, it was a very incredible experience and it's fun to work with some incredible reporters on the ground. Mm -hmm. So do you feel that your presence there, working with these people, in any way um, was inspirational for them and, and vice versa, that uh, in that relationship of reporter and subject, does something happen that, um, that elevates both um, and gives both a sort of added sense of courage? And On my part, of course, um, it's amazing to see how people live their lives, and I know it's cliche to say, but they're so generous. I got offered so many meals, people asked after me consistently. There were a few times where I was working alone and they were always looking out for me. Um, but on top of that, towards the end of my time with them, I was taking family portraits of everybody. Everybody was like going in to change their clothes and ensure that they looked presentable and they wanted to get family portraits done. So yeah, there, you do reach a certain point where they understand what your intentions are and you have to try to communicate that as well as you can. And usually that just comes by spending time with people and gaining their trust on the ground. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. Um, yeah, it's hard, it's hard for me to say how, how my presence there, you know, has any sort of effect on them after I leave. Um, but the most rewarding part of this whole reporting project, for, for me at least, was uh, when our fixer actually, uh, uh, Prem, he, uh, when we first went to one of the kilns that was highlighted in the PBS piece, identified this, this boy uh, who is featured in this story, uh, Dorja Lama, um, who was at the kiln, been working there for several months. Um, not sure of his exact age, but well under 14. Um, I've been working there, guiding mules to and from the kiln uh, with fresh bricks just day in and day out. And, and we approached him uh, when we went for a second visit and spent quite a bit of time with him asking about the work he's done. And, and being able to then report that to Homraj and then hear that they had gone back and rescued him, um, even though it's just one person out of you know, millions of kids who, who are in the situation, um, but knowing that he now you know, as far as I know, I've, I've been trying to keep up with the organization who's taking care of him now. Um, you know, he's in school, he's out of the kiln, he's met with his family again, knowing that, you know, there might be a life beyond, you know, for as far as he knew was all there was going to be was working at this kiln. So, so that was a really rewarding experience for me to have. Um, but beyond that, you know, it's hard to say exactly how the interaction will, 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 will stay with people. Right. We, caught Georgia, we caught Georgia at a time when he was about to potentially go back to India and there would have been no tracking him after that. So I think, yeah, that was another aspect to me that was, was pretty incredible and something you rarely experience when you're reporting to see that you had a, uh, that kind of effect on somebody's life directly, hopefully for the better. That's wonderful. Fred, in the, in the video we saw, um, I think the part that touched me the most was about the, um, the daughter 
um, in the family and just the sacrifice and the pride and the joy that uh, the parents felt for her. And I think that's something that would resonate with anyone from any culture, regardless of their background, of um, just that sense of love and, and commitment to the well-being of their offspring. So I'm just um, curious in your coverage of stories from around the world for the Undertoward Stories Project for PBS and in other contexts, what is universal about this quest to end forced child labor in Nepal and India? And how does it pertain to all of us? And how does it fit into a larger picture of what's going on in the world today? You know, um, I mentioned in the preamble to that in introduction to the video that we look for strong characters and people's stories to tell. And I knew I hit the jackpot with that tiny little exchange about that girl's aspiration. Uh, I'm willing to bet that half a dozen people in this room would volunteer to put that child through medical school based on, on the number of uh, requests that have gone to Home Raj. Am I correct, Home Raj? Uh, the number of people who want mm -hmm. to put yes. Ritika through medical school, which is kind of a pipe dream at many levels. And just as an aside, we did a story about Nepal's recovery effort from the earthquake, and I ended that story with this mother and child, the only surviving child in her family, that she was trying to put through school, and what does she want to do when she grows up? And She wants to be a doctor. And we got people calling and looking to support that. I found another such case in my most recent trip to Uganda. I think there's something universal in all of us that just really um, abhors suffering when it happens to children in, in innocent. And we've all seen the image from Aleppo of the young boy who survived that bombing. And that has moved more people than any of the images that have you know, come out of Syria in, in two or three years practically. There's something about that. And it's very important we get to those types of stories. So I do think that that is something universal. Where we fail as journalists and as journalism organizations, I think, and I, and I don't mean this to blame anybody so much as the very nature of the beast, is in not following up on this. We had all kinds of responses to this particular story um, with a lot of people looking to help that individual child, and I've seen that happen before. There was something that became relevant to our lives. This could have been our daughter, our grandchild. We want to see that child fulfill that aspiration. And, and what we need to do more of, I think, is tell the story, uh, tell stories in the fashion that really uh, brings out the humanity in these stories and the human suffering. <clears throat> That's a fine aspiration journalistically. You turn that around and you say, how do you do this? Because the biggest challenge or enemy that we face is, uh, in these kinds of stories is a perception that there's a fatigue out there. Not another one of these stories about people suffering in a diff distant country. So how do you find creative ways and the resources and, and, uh, and the time in many ways to keep going back and telling new versions of the same story because they are important stories to tell and to do that with the reality on the ground when it comes to journalism um, and, and getting people's attention. Uh, that is the perpetual challenge that we face um, is, is to really play our part in telling important stories for the sake of providing clear information. And I am not Home Raj's advocate. I'm just telling a good story that he's helping me tell. Uh, there's, a, there's a fine line there. But how do we do this in a way that, that gets this, that keeps an awareness out there? And I get you know, distress from other parts of my my work. Some of you might recall a, uh, a collapse of a factory in Bangladesh three years ago that killed 1,100 um, garment workers. I am willing to bet that almost every one of us in this room has a garment sewn in Bangladesh or 25 in your closet if you're not wearing it right now. Um, 
what hasn't happened is a sense of connection between us as consumers and these mostly young women, four million of them, who sew our garments. And this is not, as Homeraj pointed out, a black and white villains and heroes kind of narrative. There's a lot of grayness. Um, there is a lot of good that has happened bang in Bangladesh economically to uplift people and uh, out of poverty. But where does that cross the line into abusive conditions? Um, I want to dwell on that example um, for what it has taught us in many ways because three years ago there was a lot of attention to the collapse because every brand name that we know in fashion was implicated in some way, if not in that very building that killed 1,100 workers, somewhere else. Because in the, in the several thousand garment factories in Bangladesh, there was not one single fire system in the building. Just imagine that. There are no systems to protect the safety of workers, for example. And there were strong resolutions to start a process to make that happen. It became visible to us, and a lot of the top brands made commitments to raise wages, to raise safety standards. And what happened? We have heard almost nothing New York Times has followed up on this story once or twice um, on an annual sort of anniversary kind of look back. But the accountability just isn't there. There's a distance between us and them. And, and our role, I think, is to find ways to lessen that distance. It should be a slam dunk with children because there's no question who likes, you know, there's no gray, grayness when it comes to employing children. Um, so why is this practice so pervasive? Um, so that's what distresses me. What gives me hope is some of the work that we've witnessed here, and Homeraj is affiliated with Good Weave, which is an organization in, um, that was started in India that is now a major presence in, in Washington, D.C. And what they've been able to do is get a rug certificate, a certification for rugs um, that are sewn in looms across South Asia. And the number of children working in carpet looms in the region has just plummeted over the last 20 years or so. It's not perfect. You still find a lot of children working in looms, but the, but the visibility and the sensitivity has been gained by the work of people like Kailash Satyarthi and others who are affiliated with uh, the larger organization that Homeraj works for. And, the, and most recently, the Target Corporation signed on with Goodweave to say that henceforth, every rug we, we sell will have a Goodweave Good Weave label, which is essentially a certification process by which uh, you can buy a, a rug at, Carp, at Target and rest assured that no children were involved in its, in its creation. And once you have big players like Target in, in, the, in the picture, you really reached a point where you've created enough awareness, enough sensitivity uh, on an issue, and, uh, and it gives me hope that we can actually, and, and that must have come in some way from the visibility that journalism brings to these issues. So I think we have a role to play, and journalism is in, isn't, I mean, I can't tell you what an exceptional resource the Christian Science Monitor is in the journalism landscape these days. I mean, you just don't see that kind of um, resource being, being dedicated to telling these kinds of stories. It's a, it's a real struggle. So one day will come, I hope, that we'll see more resources to, to, to raising visibility for some of these issues. And child labor should be a slam dunk because it is not hard to eradicate um, with the right systems in place, and the carpet industry has, has proven that. That's great. So um, we have some remaining time, and we'd love to hear from you here in the audience. If you have any, any kind of questions, there is a um, stand-up mic right here. Um, so please uh, feel free to come up and uh, pose any kind of question um, to our panel, either in Kathmandu or, or here in, in Boston. Um, so we invite you to do that, but 
Um, sort of in, in, in the meantime, Elizabeth, I'd love to kind of get your um, response on, uh, from, from Michael and from Anne, we got a sense of these stories of hope, these stories of transformation. Um, has there been anything equivalent that you've uh, encountered in, in your work? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think what really struck me listening to Homraj was his kind of vision of this work and the level of responsibility that is required of it that goes right from the individual level up to the corporate and government level. Um, from being in restaurants up to corporate social accountability and a very kind of clear-eyed assessment of the difficulties that exist at all of these different levels. And I think the role as a researcher is to look at activists that are challenging accepted kind of narratives about child and bonded labor um, and pushing really kind of positive uh, and effective approaches and take these up to different policymakers and governments that may uh, not otherwise be listening and to really be kind of have your ears and eyes open to that. Um, I think that another interesting thing that I was kind of thinking on is, you know, the, the issues that surround this kind of new era of, of good weave and corporate social responsibility because it's so promising and so much has been achieved. Uh, but also the, the, at the end of the day that people's memories are very short. Um, and when you're going to buy, not all of us can go into a restaurant and ask if there are child laborers or if your rug was produced using child labor. So really the responsibility, you have to have these kinds of initiatives in conjunction with governments pushing companies to do this where the incentive doesn't come from consumers. And you and the role of the media and, and researchers really is to push governments towards doing that, but always taking your cue from, from of course, there, there are always optimistic stories. This is how progress happens because people are, are fighting to make things better on the ground. That's great. Can I just yeah. add? Add, add a thought to, to what Elizabeth did. And, and you know, one, of I th one of the challenges, I think, in many parts of the world is the quality of governance and the government's ability to execute in many ways. Um, India is a classic example of a country that has very progressive laws on many fronts. But the implementation, especially when you get to second and third tier urban areas, is, is almost non-existent. And there are organizations, ironically, in the non-government sector who are now dedicating themselves to building better governance. You know, Partners in Health, which is based in, in Boston and Haiti, is working to build up you know, the government in Haiti so that it is, because only a government, as they say, can accord its people human rights. Non-government agencies cannot do that. And, and you need to have strong government and strong governance in, uh, in many of these situations to try and, uh, and right some of these wrongs. And until that happens, I think um, a lot of pl places are seeing the home rogers of this world working despite instead of with um, we have a government question? systems. Hi. Hi. First, uh, thanks for all the great work you guys are doing. It's a wonderful project. I'm curious to know how you chose the kiln that you profiled in the piece and if you got any resistance from the managers when you went up in to photograph them or to write about them. Thanks. Sure. Um, well, how, how it worked, uh, Ann and I actually arrived in Nepal, I think about five days before Fred and his team came. Um, and we spent a couple of days out with our, our fixer and with recommendations from Homraj too. He, he came along for a lot of our trips uh, visiting different kilns outside of Kathmandu where we were based. I mean, you go 20 minutes outside of the city and there's kilns just, just everywhere. Um, so we visited a couple. Uh, and the, the kiln we profiled actually um, is working with Better Brick Nepal. Uh, so Homraj had known the owner. Um, they'd worked closely together. And so when we arrived, there was, there was no resistance at that one. But we did visit some, especially in India, it was um, a totally different experience. Yeah, where where supervisors 
were very resistant to us being there. We'd speak to them for a little bit, but if we tried to go talk to the workers, they would ask us to come back. Um, it was a lot more tense, I feel like, than, than in Nepal. And, and maybe it was simply because in Nepal we were with Home Raj and people who, who knew how to navigate. And in India, a lot of times we just got on our own, which we did a couple of times in Nepal. Uh, but, but for the most part, um, at this film we featured at least, there, was, there wasn't too much resistance there with us being there. I'm not sure if Fred had the same experience or, or not. Pretty much the same, and, and you know, we carry a much, what Fred Friendly used to call the 60 pound pencil, which is the whole camera crew, so we're less um, invisible. Or we, um, technology is helping now to some extent, but oftentimes you have to play this by ear depending on where you are and what theater you are. There are parts of the world where I can blend in just because of my ethnicity into a situation and be less of a, a threat or be just more savvy in, in navigating. There are places where I have to stay the heck away from, from that. You know, I, I've worked in China where the crew who are Chinese will tell me, you stay in the hotel, we'll get the footage um, because the presence of an outsider will raise too many red flags. So I think all of us are familiar with these kinds of tactics where you have to do what you can to get the images and the, uh, and the information. You have a responsibility, I think, to the people on the ground, too, because your presence, you know, photographing some of these people when we were in Nepal was one thing because it had been vetted by Homraj, so we knew that the owners wouldn't take retribution on any of the subjects that I was photographing, but we had to be very careful of that in Nepal for kilns that we hadn't vetted because I could walk onto the kiln photograph somebody and they'd be very friendly with me, but then the kiln owner hadn't given permission and then what happens to that person after I leave? You have to take into account what's going to happen to the subjects that you're photographing afterwards. So in that respect, we had to be careful about where we were going and how we were interacting with people because we didn't want any kind of retribution um, to be taken against any of the subjects. Thanks all for all the great work you're, you've done and are doing. Um, I was just interested, and I may have missed this earlier, about the history of this issue of child labour, perhaps in Nepal and India more generally. Um, is, is this something that is progressively getting more coverage and is getting better, or is, this a, is child labour in a lot of instances something that's gotten worse in sort of the modern globalised world? I'm, I'm just interested to know you know whether this is just a, a progression or whether in some ways it's how it's evolved over time I can speak to that uh, I think in terms of India the rate of child labor has been reduced dramatically in the last 30 years um, largely due to increasing international invention and also there's been more kind of recently there's been a lot more attention directed to the problem since sort of Kailash Satyadi was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, but it's, as I said earlier, it's very difficult to know, particularly with these kinds of worse forms of child labor, what the national trends are at all, um, particularly because they're so hard to measure and examine and trends are, they're just under-researched really. Uh, but I think that it's, Im it's important not to lose sight of the fact that uh, regional and global trends are positive and it's largely due to the work of um, local rights activists. Well, um, just would love to get um, some final thoughts from our panelists while we still have you and, uh, and also if there's any question that you would want to pose to um, one of your fellow panelists before uh, you, you scatter, um, so anything that's, uh, that's burning in you, either as a question or as a comment. Um. I have a question for you. How do you, you talked about um, humanizing the situation. I think that's what journalists try to do. When you man mentioned Bangladesh, the image that comes to mind, maybe you guys have seen this, the couple that was buried in the rubble who were facing each other. And I think that was, you know, won many photography awards. And that, when I think of that issue, that image brings it home, personalizes it to me. How do you fight fatigue? And also, like, the Mokten family, um, 
how do you continue to find those families to expand people's awareness and concern with the situation? Aside from writing the stories, we spend the most energy finding that character that was, that's going to clinch this story for us because it really puts it in very personal, moving terms. And in Bangladesh, we've actually followed the uh, fortunes of a young woman who was rescued from the rubble of that building. Um, and, and, and her problems were due to revisit. Um, and she is a very, very sympathetic character. She's had a bad, bad back. She went from being a provider for the family to being um, in, in a very handicapped condition, and her mother has had to quit work to work. It was, it was a very compelling story in that sense, and it's, it's serially told. You see her then, you see her now. And then you bring out, you know, a little, a little anecdote, a little outburst of some kind, you know, like the, the, the young girl, uh, like Ritika, who wants to go to medical school. And in, and in this girl's case, she told the story about just always imagining where these shirts went that she sewed day in and day out. And so one day she slipped a piece of paper in several of the shirt pockets saying, if you like this shirt, call me. <laughs> and she wrote her phone number on it. And I, and I said, did you get it? And she got two or three responses. She had no idea what they were saying. But it was just a thrill. And it just brought out, um, and I'm the father of, two daughters who've been through this phase. I mean, all of us can relate, you know, to this human urge to be curious, to aspire, to have hope. And I just clinched the whole story because this, you know, you, you saw the story at ground level as this young woman who's 18, 19 years old now, um, lived it. All her suffering, you know, the, 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 um, leather uh, harness that, she's, you know, that she struggles through. Um, everything just gelled with that one little anecdote of um, you know, trying to communicate with the world out there. So you know, we spend a lot of energy looking for those kinds of things, which I'm sure you, Michael, certainly do, and, and then you share and, and bring them to life. And the bigger challenge is how do you do that? <laughs> Elizabeth, I, I mean, do you have a problem with um, with the fatigue out there? What um, I mean, are you looking to raise the profile of these issues? Um, you know, when you come out with reports, what, what, what do you hope to to get out of these ultimately? Well, I think a few things. Personally, I think that it's extremely important to take rigorous analysis and data of what is happening and put that in spaces where it can influence policy and practice um, in a way that may not be clickbaitable but is really dependable and reliable. Um, and I think to make space for that in the academic canon is important, um, but also just to uh, listen really to what, because social movements and social movements to address problems as entrenched, entrenched as these change and to be paying attention to that and making sure that systems are responding. Um, and personally, I, because what I do involves a lot of field research as well, I, do, I never get fatigue. Um, yeah. But I, I, was, I was hoping that, um, Homeraj, you could tell us a bit about how we can continue to follow your work and to support it following on from this event. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, there is so much uh, that can be done, really. I mean, uh, especially during this reconstruction um, that uh, a lot of uh, buildings are going up and, uh, you know, those would be built from the international support. So I think you know, each of the people who are in the room and, and who are watching uh, around the world, uh, you, know, ha you know, has some responsibility and some way of contributing 
because, you know, they can simply tell their government, uh, the congressmen and senators saying that, you know, hey, you know, our tax dollars should not be used uh, to promote, you know, exploitative practices around the world, including, you know, in these places, I mean, you know, um, you know connecting to the BRICS, I guess, uh, definitely, you know, um, a lot of times when um, people take that action, it actually, uh, you know, turns out to be really uh, valuable and it does have an impact. So, and then that's one way of doing it at individual level from everybody. And then from the, the academic level, I think, uh, raising these issues and then, you know, writing about it and, as you said, you know, uh, doing analysis um, and, uh, you know, bring, bringing out the issues and, you know, what things are working and, you know, what uh, things are not working and then uh, where the gaps are. You know, a lot of times what I see is that, you know, uh, people have conferences and, uh, you know, events uh, in, uh, in, in different places, but, uh, you know, those are, uh, you know, those alone will not be able to solve problems. Somehow that discussion, that conversation needs to actually, uh, you, know, uh, you know, needs to be brought down to the very grassroots level where, uh, you know, we can plant the seed of change but that seed has to actually take root to be uh, sustainable. And then for that, it requires, you know, a lot of follow through, you know, a lot of looking at, you know, how things are working, you know, where things are uh, not moving right, or uh, if there are positive, positive changes that are taking place, you know, bringing those out and then you know, sharing those stories. So I think, you know, so that's one way that can be, uh, uh, you know, definitely that, um, you know, you guys can contribute uh, from far away. And then, you know, just uh, keeping the issue alive because a lot of times, you know, that's what happens, you know, uh, in the, the, the issues of development is that you do projects for one year, two year, three year. And then if, they, if it cannot take the roots at the grassroots level, then it will be, you know, uh, another project that lasted for a few years and then, you know, contributed a little bit at that time. And then, the problem shifts um, uh, something. So basically, you know, when we are talking about changes, those changes need to be uh, really brought down to the root so that, you know, the whole entire system, the ecosystem can um, experience the change so that they cannot go back. Can I ask a very quick follow-up question uh, to, to Homraj? Homraj, um, has the money actually started flowing of the uh, $4 billion in pledges? Well, I think, uh, you know, very little um, uh, has actually flown. So I think, you know, the international community is looking at uh, Nepal government's expendability and, you know, uh, you know, all those kind of things. But eventually, I think it's going to uh, flow. But, um, you know, what I have heard is about maybe one billion has actually come to the country, but the remaining 3.1 is still in the place. Uh, issue, That's a but that uh, that needs to be verified. <laughs> the conversion of pledges to actual dollars delivered um, has been an issue in many in many cases through history of natural disaster, where countries in the immediate aftermath make pledges of uh, of support, and uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that that money will will wind up uh, or or say when it will being yeah, exactly. where it was targeted. <clears throat> So, Homraj, just one sort of final vision from you um, of uh, just how you see things progressing and, and really what your, your vision is for um, where you'd like to see this issue a year from now, two years from now, um, and, uh, and can we get there? Well, I think, um, you know, we can get there, but I wouldn't say in two or three years because, you know, it's a, such a entrenched uh, issue and then, you know, it's the, the, the big industry is connected to, you know, the health issues, the gender issue, the child labor issue, bonded labor issue, um, and, you know, the, the poverty economics issue. It's, a, it's, it's a, you know, it, it touches all aspects of uh, people's lives. So, once we, you know, uh, make some dent in the child and, and bonded labor situation, and then 
once people start to see the benefit out of you know uh, uh, this particular change, I think it will definitely uh, we can we can see all the uh, the bricks produced in the country free of you know child and bonded labor. But that's in, that's gonna take number of years because it's it's not gonna be one or two. Ultimately, you know, we want to transform all the you know eleven hundred plus uh, brick industries uh, that are in the country. And we are only working with uh, 23, and then we are adding another uh, 17 to make uh, altogether 40. I mean, you know, it's, it's not uh, huge, but it's not small either because it's already uh, creating a ripple effect. Uh, we are getting a lot of requests from, you know, a lot of kiln owners that we want to be part of this program because, you know, uh, we want to also help uh, contribute. And uh, so, when we are able to certify these uh, brick kilns, saying that you know they are producing free of child and bonded labor, and then they are environmentally responsible, that working conditions are good, you know, um, workers' rights are being uh, uh, protected, and uh, people are getting the wages they you know uh, need to get, you know, all those things. I think it's going to take some time, but I'm very optimistic and hopeful that there will be change because we have already seen. And then uh, the, the idea is that uh, the laws alone, like uh, Fred was saying earlier, that there are already laws that have been established. And, uh, you know, those laws need to be implemented. But the, the implementation of the laws might not be just because, you know, we want them to be implemented. I think there has to be some sort of, uh, you know, incentive that can be uh, provided to all levels of stakeholders in that particular uh, business. And that's what we are trying to do. So we are addressing from multiple uh, angles. It's not only about child labor, you know, it's not only about bonded labor, it's about, you know, their uh, businesses, it's about environment, it's about people's health. You know, you know, one of the things that these uh, kiln owners need to know is that their health is also, uh, you know, at risk because they are um, around that, uh, you know, area. So if they actually improve the conditions for workers, they are improving the conditions for themselves. So, you know, those those are the kind of, you know, micro, uh, you know, uh, information that we have to, you know, uh, share with these people so that, you know, we can change. So ultimate vision is, you know, child labor free, uh, you know, the hotels, libraries, e schools, hospitals, all, you know, in Nepal built out of, you know, the socially responsible construction materials and, you know, driving that change. And then, you know, the brick can be, you know, one of the, uh, the starting point. Well, that's terrific. Thank you so much, Fumaraj, for uh, crystallizing that vision and what Nepal needs to do. And, um, and I just thank so much our, our panel um, and you, Homraj, as well, for uh, giving us so, so much more insight into what um, is involved in this issue. Um, I know it's sort of deepened my, my sense of, um, of what is going on and my interest, and I, I'm sure that's true for the, the rest of us here in this room and those who are watching online. So, Fred, thank you so much, and, and Anne, and Michael, and Elizabeth, and Homraj, and... Um, what time is it in, in Nepal right now, Homraj? It's a 6.18 a.m. Wow. Well, I, I can only imagine what you're like at, uh, at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. You're a great ball of energy. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming, and um, we look forward to inviting you back uh, for our next event here at the Mary Bickerty Library and at the home of the, the Christian Science Monitor.